It is still largely unknown just how colossal the great city of Ur could have once been. Ur, once the most important Sumerian city-state in ancient Mesopotamia around 3rd millennium BC, is where the remains of the great ziggurat lay. And just as with the ancient city, only the foundations of this once enormous pyramid still exist today. Just how big this pyramid once was is now left to the imagination, although one could calculate the structure's original possible size based on the ascent angle of many other ancient pyramidal structures from around the world. A range between 48 to 53 degrees would be a very safe benchmark to use, which would have made this once complete structure located on the Daikar province in South Iraq an awe-inspiring sight. Yet what must be the most interesting of details regarding this very ancient structure, characteristics of which make this building stand out as obviously a very important piece of the puzzle regarding the pyramids, has to undoubtedly be the living quarters which were actually built into the pyramid for the use of an ancient alien, a god, who apparently came from the sky. Before delving into the details of which I feel it is important to point out, our previous video covering Mario Bildrup's compelling work, collaborative data which correlates over 500 ancient structures on Earth to past cardinal reference points or North Pole locations from over half a million years ago, interestingly, he singles out the great ziggurat among others. In particular, the Sphinx as noticeably the most ancient of monuments that he has correlated on Earth. If his work becomes peer-reviewed, it would, along with numerous other research projects, strongly suggest certain monuments on Earth have survived several ice ages, the city of Ur's pyramid being but one of these ancient sites. Regardless of Mario's compelling work, historical facts surrounding this ancient alien god, who is said to have resided within this great pyramid within Iraq, has already been translated and thus well established on many occasions. The Great Ziggurat consists of successive platforms which have a solid core of mud brick, which was then covered by burnt bricks. This outer layer is said to have protected the core from the elements. The mainstream archaeological and historical understanding of the construction is that it began under King Ur-Namu of the Third Dynasty of Ur, around the 21st century BC, and was completed by his son, King Shulgi. The Great Ziggurat of Ur was located in the temple complex of the city-state, which was the administrative heart of Ur. Although we would postulate, just like the ancient Egyptian cities, which also build up around these monumental and mysterious structures, were merely modern colonizations of sites which were far older. It is a well-known fact that many cities, towns, villages, and indeed temples are often rebuilt, reconstructed upon much older foundations. It is a common mistake to perceive a historical understanding's beginning, which occurred at a certain point within history, as that of the site's creation. Many sites all over the world are far older than that of the academic records made upon said subjects. The great ziggurat of Ur is largely accepted as having been dedicated to the moon god Nana, who is the patron deity of the city. It is interesting that Nana is a very ancient deity indeed. And of course, in all possibility, was once a very real entity, an ancient alien who visited Earth and attributed as a god. It is likely that this occurred at night, thus making him or her a moon god. Why, for example, would you create a monumentally sized building in the dedication of this god, with a throne which rested upon the top overlooking the city? Why would one feel the requirement to build living quarters into the temple? a bedchamber complete with furnishing. Why would one completely build the structure around the living need of an imaginary giant, if one was never intending on using it? Nana has turned up in mythology from cultures throughout the world over the ages. And this, of course, may have been for good reason. She also appears in Norse mythology in the 6th century, thus having been connected by some scholars with the Sumerian goddess Inanna, the goddess Babylonian Ishtar, or the Phrygian goddess Nana, mother of the god Attis. Scholar Rudolf Simek opines that identification with Inanna, Nanar, or Nana is hardly likely due to the large distances in time and location between the figures. Yet, alas, this form of conclusion 
based on academic paradigm rather than a sheer possibility, is a very dangerous mindset indeed. Scholar Hilda Ellis Davidson says that while the idea of a link with Sumerian Inanna, Lady of Heaven, was attractive to early scholars, the notion seems unlikely. Though she too lacks a compelling argument for her conclusion, we find the notion of scholars, assuming, to be a dangerous scenario for the rest of humanity, and we perceive such attitude as an attack on open critical thought. We do, however, find the facts surrounding the possible past existence of Nana, along with the theories surrounding the true antiquity of this one enormous structure, to be highly compelling. Have you ever heard of a man known as Og? References to Og appear in the Phoenician inscriptions from Byblos, within the much older Canaanite Ugaritic texts, within Midian on the northwest Arab Peninsula, in Deuteronomy, in the Book of Numbers, and in Joshua. Mentioned in many religious and non-religious texts, King of Basham, which is now the Golan Heights. Who was this Og? Well, it turns out, Og was a giant. A rather special giant. He was, in fact, the last of his kind. The Book of Numbers states that he died during the Battle of Edrai. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11 declares that his bedstead, translated in some texts as sarcophagus, was made of iron and was 9 cubits in length and 4 cubits in width, about 13 and a half feet by 6 feet. It goes on to say that at the royal city of the Ammonites, his giant bedstead could still be seen as a novelty at the time the texts were written. Fast forward to the present day, and a miraculous discovery has been made. A discovery which could see more biblical stories being proven historically accurate. A recent archaeological dig has unearthed no less than two dozen skeletons, all of giant proportions near the ancient ruins of Rujim el Herai which is indeed located within the Golan Heights. What's more, compellingly, this was no normal burial. During a press briefing, the team responsible for the discovery expressed their views to the world. Quote, The site of Rujem el Hire has been extensively searched for decades already, but our team noticed a mound nearby, which we thought was of major interest. It has been two long years, but it was definitely worth the effort. Said Tom Yagur, one of the archaeologists on site. One of the giants was covered in an exquisitely crafted suit of copper armor. One of their copper swords was also as hard as steel and made in a fashion unknown to modern man. Could this really be the final resting place of the last of the giants? All we can hope is that the Smithsonian doesn't get a chance to buy them. Edinburgh, Scotland a very ancient land with a castle built upon an extinct volcano. Many mysterious things lay and possibly live within Scotland, the most famous of which undoubtedly the extremely elusive Loch Ness Monster. However, recent surveys would suggest that among the most popular of attractions are in fact its vast collection of, to the well-trained eye, extremely ancient coves and cave systems. Hand-cut, these caverns will demonstrate the immense skill, determination, and of course ingenuity of our distant ancestors, revealing to all those who are lucky enough to visit them just what these ancient people were capable of. And hidden behind a modest door on Drum Street in Gilmerton is quite possibly the most incredible network of them all – underground passageways, large, perfectly carved chambers, benches, tables, and even a small chapel all painstakingly hewn from solid stone by hand. And thankfully, due to their popular attraction with tourists, often the explorers amongst us, many open-minded individuals, have often been left with a sense of discomposure regarding the officially upheld explanation for their origins. As such, and rather predictably, many alternative theories, often involving a far more ancient origin for the cove and its purpose now abound. The mass regurgitated view regarding the construction would suggest that a blacksmith by the name of George Patterson, who actually resided within the cove within the 18th century, somehow created them alone, by hand, and within a mere five-year period, with even George himself claiming to have cut this extensive, elaborate, and unquestionably enigmatic underground structure using simple hand tools. 
Since the claims three centuries ago, however, numerous holes have been seemingly discovered within this popularly upheld sequence of events, fueling the already prevalent suspicions within skeptic parties, maybe in an attempt to hide its true antiquity, as we experience so often during our research. On Wednesday, the 15th of August, 1906, a front-page column by a writer known as F. R. Coles for The Scotsman dug into George Patterson's version of events, commonly referred to as the tradition. Coles found it to have been nothing but a fictional fallacy, possibly created by George himself in an attempt to profit from deception. It seems Patterson not only accomplished the seemingly impossible, excavating hundreds of tons of stone, but also it seems he successfully went unnoticed by the entire surrounding population during this entire procedure. Just who could have built Gilmerton Cove? When was it built? Why did they build it? With modern radar scans of the surrounding area indicating that even more systems lay close by, still undiscovered, possibly isolated by ancient cave-ins, you have to wonder, could the Gilmerton Cove be far older and originally far grander and extensively larger than anyone today could have ever possibly imagined? Will we ever solve the mystery of Gilmerton Cove? It seems only time will tell. Many attributed the legend surrounding the great king of Uruk and many of the city's written attributes to mythology. Uruk is said to have become famous as the capital city of the king Gilgamesh, the ancient ruler and hero of the epic of Gilgamesh. It is believed that Uruk was the biblical Erech from Genesis 10.10, the second city founded by Nimrod in Shinar. The Epic of Gilgamesh, written by a Middle Eastern scholar 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, commemorates the life of the ruler of the city of Uruk, from which Iraq gets its name. In 2003, just prior to the Iraq invasion which toppled Hussein, astonishing discoveries were being made in Iraq, culminating in one of the most extraordinary claims anywhere for centuries a claim which American forces have been strongly accused of confiscating, subsequently becoming the prime suspect as the driving force behind a complete suppression of these astonishing discoveries within the country. In April of 2003, Jörg Fossbinder of the Bavarian Department of Historical Monuments in Munich told the BBC's World Services Science and Action Program, quote, I don't want to say definitively that it was the grave of King Gilgamesh, but it looks very similar to that described in the epic. We found just outside the city, an area in the middle of the former Euphrates River, the remains of such a building which could be interpreted as a burial," Mr. Fossbinder said. In the book, Gilgamesh is described as having been buried under the Euphrates. He said the amazing discovery of the ancient city under the Iraqi desert had been made possible by modern technology. The most surprising thing was that we found structures already described by Gilgamesh, Mr. Fossbinder stated. We covered more than 100 hectares. We found garden structures and field structures as described in the epic, and we found Babylonian houses. Here, predictably, is where the story goes silent. Due to conflict within the country, it was largely believed the excavations had been halted. However, it seems that the discovery of King Gilgamesh may not have been made in isolation. This footage was supposedly leaked to numerous places across the internet and has largely been put down as authentic footage of the find. Shortly after this was taken, reports state that American forces moved in and seized the find. Why do the powers that be see fit to suppress such discoveries, the very real tombs of characters long thought to have been mythical, Osiris being but one example among many which have undoubtedly been hidden from the public? Maybe some clues to why his tomb has been hidden lay within the epic and the immense powers Gilgamesh was said to have possessed. He was the fifth king of Uruk, and his power was so mighty, many believe that the stories surrounding him are just myths that were built around his seemingly superhuman strength and endurance. However, serious scholars concluded that the story of Gilgamesh was nothing more than a fairy tale due to the astonishing story. In the epic, the great king is thought to be too proud and arrogant by the gods, and so they decide to teach him a lesson, sending the wild man, Enkidu, to humble him. Enkidu and Gilgamesh, after a fierce battle in which neither are bested, 
become friends and embark on adventures together. When Enkidu is struck with death, Gilgamesh falls into a deep grief and, recognizing his own mortality through the death of his friend, questions the meaning of life and the value of human accomplishment in the face of ultimate extinction. Casting away all his old vanity and pride, Gilgamesh sets out on a quest to find the meaning of life and, finally, some way of defeating death. In doing so, he becomes the first epic hero in world literature. The grief of Gilgamesh and the questions his friend's death evoke resonate with every human being who has wrestled with the meaning of life in the face of death. Is this leaked footage of the tomb of Gilgamesh? Regardless of its authenticity, why all the secrecy? Are we, as a species, not capable of being presented with things which test our core beliefs without erupting into chaos? It seems for now, we may have to wait to find out. Although we have recently been focusing our attentions upon the Giza Plateau, and indeed, the incredible story these miraculous features could tell us regarding the past, there exists many other sites around the world which possess similar astounding ruins to that of the great monuments. Chechen Itza According to academia, this site was constructed by the Mayans a mere 2,000 years ago. Made up of several pyramidal structures, temples dedicated to different animals, and what is probably the most visited, most astonishing, yet most infrequently academically shared ancient site to be found anywhere on Earth. Known as the Great Ball Court, its massive size is nothing short of architectural marvel. And the fact that it has survived the eons, still possessing such impact upon the landscape, is testament to its incredibly skilled builders. The Ball Court temples, in particular the Jaguar Temple, possesses the same tremendous artistic vision and advanced, now lost, knowledge of stone cutting found all over Earth, which is indicative of a lost civilization's work, rather than the Mayans, who are members of our own well-documented history. Some of the Jaguar Temple is constructed from stone block. However, the main enormous artistic features were apparently carved from single enormous multi-ton blocks. Furthermore, and most importantly, the actual ball court is an enormous space, the dimensions of which measure 175 meters north-south and 70 meters east to west, making it much larger than a modern-day American football field. On each side of the field, stone walls rising more than 7 meters enclose the action. Embedded near the top of each wall was a center hoop, the goal carved from stone and detailed with feathered serpents. There are several supposed accounts of both the Aztecs and Maya playing the game at the time of the Spanish conquest. Of the hundreds of images of the game found amongst the ancient art, the ball is rarely displayed being handled, so it has been deduced that the game was indeed an ancient form of football, although unfortunately, no version of the rules has ever been discovered. No larger than a basketball, academics claim the object ball was made from solid rubber, presumably making it considerably heavy. Just how they managed to kick such a heavy football through such a goal area at such a height is unknown. Although, perhaps, the most perplexing of the mysteries involved with this unquestionably incredible ancient event is just how our ancient ancestors, at some time within the distant past, actually managed to create such a location from scratch, with such artistic vision, skill, and knowledge of building such solid architecture. An incredible game which must have been a memorable experience for all involved. Were these incredible structures made with simple tools, as academics claim? Or is it actually an extremely ancient relic of a game which has clearly survived the eons? <laughs>